Well, hi, everyone. I like to always give everybody a chance to kind of get situated in the webinar here, but welcome. Um, we're glad you're here for another installment of a series that we just love doing, WGF Library Script Breakdown. My name is Lauren O'Connor. And I'm Javier Barrios, and Lauren and I are librarians at the Writers Guild Foundation Library, as you probably know. Um, but just in case uh, somebody here is not familiar with the library, uh, we are located in the WGA West Building uh, here in LA, and we collect and provide access to thousands of scripts. And the library is open. You don't have to be a member to come by and do research. We're open to the public. And uh, my colleague Enid is going to toss a link into the chat with more information about the library. Um, now, if you're new to WGF Library Script Breakdown, this is how it works. Um, Javier and I uh, sit down on Zoom with a writer, or in this case, a writing team. Um, and we discuss at length a script that they wrote with pages on screen. Um, and for this session, we're thrilled to welcome uh, Tony Phelan and Joan Rader, uh, creators and writers and executive producers of the limited series, A Small Light. Um, they're here to discuss the pilot script with us, which we're super excited about because we, um, on WGF Library Script Breakdown, we haven't really um, delved into um, TV drama series or limited series before. So this is a first for us. Um, also, um, I hope everybody here read Tony and Joan's bios on the events page uh, to see that their major career breakthrough was on season two of Grey's Anatomy, which I think is objectively one of the best TV seasons of all time. Um, <laughs> so let's, let's all have that top of mind as we give a big uh, ASL round of applause uh, to Tony Phelan and Joan Rader. <laughs> Thank you. And so as always, um, we've got the remainder of 90 minutes on the clock uh, to go through the script in detail. We've got a ton to cover, so unfortunately there won't be any time for audience Q&A. But um, please stay engaged in the chat. It's nice to know we're not doing this in a vacuum. Say hi. Um, I hope everyone's had a chance to look over the script. Um, if not, uh, Enid's also going to link to that in the chat. Um, and by the way, if you want to read the rest of the scripts from A Small Light, uh, we have them in the library, thanks to our guests. Um, so if you come visit, you can read all the subsequent episodes. Um, that's about enough from us. Welcome again, Tony and Joan. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming. Um, so before we get uh, a look at some of the script pages, um, we always start off these uh, script breakdowns with some context questions. Okay. Um, so one question I have for you guys is, uh, can you can you tell us how this idea came about? Sure. Um, we we were familiar. So the story is of Meep Geese, who was Otto Frank's secretary, and mm -hmm. who ended up with the other office workers, helping hide the Franks and the others in the annex for two years during World War II. Meep was the also the one who ended up finding the diary after the Franks and the others were arrested and saving it for Anne when Anne would surely return. And then when Anne didn't return, she gave it to Otto and became sort of an ambassador through for the rest of her life. She lived till 100 of the diary. Meep is really an important part of that story. We knew about Meep for many men, you know, like we had read the diary, we were familiar, we had watched a documentary called Anne Frank Remembered that Meep was sort of the narrator of. And we had gone to Amsterdam maybe six years ago with our family, our two adult children, one of whom had just graduated from Columbia and was the smartest guy in the room. And... <laughs> was also kind of a hot mess because if his boyfriend didn't text him back immediately, he'd fall to the ground in, you know, agony. And this thing jumped out at us as we were touring the Anne Frank Museum in Amsterdam that Meep was about his age when Otto asked him to help save, you know, the family. And I was like struck because I know a 22 year old <laughs> and they're amazing and idealistic, but clueless. And it right. suddenly made us go, oh, that was Meep. Meep was, 
a hot mess, you know, and I want to see the story of somebody who says yes, not knowing what they're saying yes to, and then follows through on that. You know, like I, I don't think you start off being a hero. Being a hero is like doing the thing that is hard day after day for two years. I think when she said yes, she was like, oh, this will be for a couple of months. And then a couple of months goes to two years. So we're really interested in what it really looked like. And then the other piece is that after that visit to the museum, we took the bike ride that Margot and Meep take in the pilot, but opposite. We took it from the Frank, uh, from Opecta to the Frank apartment. And we looked at the apartment and it was very moving. But it was also like, let's go get ice cream now. Like we're done touring for the day. But then we turned and in the park right across from the Frank's apartment, uh, there were these little 10 year old girls doing cartwheels. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, that's Anne Frank. She was just a 10 year old girl doing cartwheels mm -hmm. when history happened to her. And she's become this thing, this icon, this representation but let's tell a story of the 10 year old girl who history happened to mm -hmm. like, so the combo platter of seeing those two things on the same day was like one of these kind of light bulb moments for us of wanting to really tell the story of the ordinary people. Wow. And when you, after the idea came, how did you know that it would be a media series as opposed to maybe something else? Tone? Um, I think I think basically because we come from television and mm -hmm. um, it felt to us like that was, once we started really breaking it down, we knew that we wanted to tell the story of Meep and Otto specifically from the moment that they meet up to about the moment that she delivers the diary to him mm -hmm. and says, puts the diary on the day that they, fi that they find out that the girls are not going to come back from the camp. She puts the diary on his desk and she says, this is the legacy of your daughter. So we felt like th those are two good bookends and, and how much time are we going to need to kind of tell that story? felt like about ultimate originally it was seven episodes and mm -hmm. then we got into the writing process and discovered that we wanted more Anne. we felt right. like we're, we're we're writing about meep we're writing about jan but at the same time we're writing about what's happening in the annex although we point of view was always a big part of how we were going to tell the story. And we determined early on that we were never going to see anything that Meep and Jan did not see. And so, um, but we got, we got into the writing process and we were like, there's an expectation that we're really going to see Anne. And, and in order to feel the loss of those people, we need to get to know them and especially her and her relationship with uh, Meep. And so we went to Nat Geo and said, we think we need another episode. And they said, you know, we trust you. If you guys feel like you need another episode. Okay. So we went from if seven I to eight. Can, if, if I can go back to your original question, how did you decide it was limited? One thing is we got this idea of like, oh, let's tell this story of the ordinary people. And, and at the same time, at the museum on this same trip, we discovered that Jan, Meep's husband, was an active member of the resistance and that Meep and Jan were not only hiding the Franks and the people in the annex, but they were hiding other people around Amsterdam. And suddenly we were like, wait, what? <laughs> like you can, like what? And so it, it suddenly our, we became just, research like we had to do all this research and and find out everything we could about who they hid wh what happened to those people and and meep has and, and so it became clear to us there was a lot right yeah. it wasn't just a one it wasn't a movie 
because like you want to get to know these people. I'm, and I think that that's that's just to interrupt you for a second. That's kind of one of the drawbacks of depictions of the diary itself. Is the diary itself is only usually an hour and a half to two hours long, and it ends before the arrest. There are all sorts of restrictions that the diary has. Plus, you know, we went on the assumption that a, a lot of our audience would be somewhat familiar with the diary, either having seen a depiction of it or ha having read it. Our advantage was you got to go before and you got to go after. So you really get to see the kind of full scope. I'm sorry, honey, go ahead. I can't even remember what I was saying. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, well, anyway, so when talk, can you talk a little bit about um, when how you got it to Nat Geo um, and uh, and and, Disc and uh, Disney Plus? Sure, like we we so we got that brainstorm of an idea, and we were on a deal at NBC at the time, and we brought it to them. I think you know they're always when you're on a deal, they want to know any, you got any ideas? Casually, like, what are you guys working on? And we would bring it, we brought it to them and, and they were sort of like, mm, historical, I don't know. Like, <laughs> and then, you know, the wind goes out of your sails a little bit when you pitch this idea that you see so clearly and people are like, nah, we'll never, <laughs> it'll never sell. So then I think we took a year of just being depressed. You know what I mean? And just sort of like, all right, we're wrong. And then we just kept coming back to it. Like, we're not wrong. This is a, this, we love this story. And in the meantime, we had hired a researcher in Amsterdam, a, a translator in Amsterdam. So we were doing a lot of research, you know, so Meep gave many, many interviews. Her husband, Jan, fewer. And so we had to sort of dig into what was going on with him. So we're doing this, all of this research and we're like becoming more and more clear that this is an amazing story. And we had gone to Keshet, who are producers and they were like in right away. And so that gave us a little confidence boost. And then um, we came up with a pitch which took about like six months to sort of hone the pitch and get the right tone and get some pictures. And I think we attached the director during this period of time. Um, you know, we we knew we wanted to like get a modern feel, nothing stuffy or like oldie fashioned -y. So Susanna Fogel had just done a flight attendant and uh, the wilds and she just like, we zoomed her, she got it immediately. So So after we kind of put together the pitch and got Susanna on board, we took it out and uh, like a lot of people crying. Like it was a, it was a great pitch and two places wanted it. One of them was Nat Geo and Nat Geo just, they wanted it worse than anyone. Like they just let it be known to us that like, this is our brand. We love this. This is us. We want to do this. Like it's like you go out on a date and you're sort of like, I like to be liked. Like they they got us and they like showed the love in the right way. And we went with them. And they also had a, uh, it turns out they had a, a production window. And they were like, if you can turn this around really fast, if you can write it fast, we can get it up and running pretty fast. And so that that worked out for us. Um, usually there's a lot more waiting uh, for, you know, production to kind of gear up. And we we were able to kind of get it get it going pretty quickly and had a very small room. Um, and by pretty and, quickly, we mean like a year. Yeah, sure. but that's pretty quick. Right. But still, you know, like you always hear these people and then they bought it right away. And then blah, everything was hard. Everything is hard all the time. But this was less hard. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Um, so I got interested in this show when it premiered um, because in quarantine, um, I was obsessed with the stage play, The Diary of Anne Frank, also by a husband and wife writing team, Francis yes. Goodrich and Albert Hackett. 
Um, it's just like that story, like Anne writing her way through hiding and isolation, just, I don't know, it spoke to me on like another level. Um, I probably read the play like five or six times, not a joke. Um, and I, I loved Meep in the play and I wanted to know more about her. So when this series came along, I was like, oh, I have to watch that. Um, so I, my question is like, what was your experience with like Anne Frank's diary before you began the project? And, you know, what was kind of meaningful about this to you that you were like, you know? Well, honestly, um, always really into Anne Frank and me, like for many, for a long time, like, and I would read it, the diary, and always get to this point where I would go, oh, maybe there will be a different ending. Like, there's no way this girl, who's so honest and funny and smart and knowing, there's no way this girl can die. You know, and you start to just like want so badly for there to be a different ending. Like, and that I think goes to just her the beauty of her honesty and her voice. Like she just came alive. So so uh it, it also just a little tangent during the shooting of the show and the writing of the show. We had to remember that, that they didn't know the ending when they went into hiding. They hid for two years and survived D-Day. And I have to believe they thought they were going to survive this. Mm -hmm. And so that feeling of like, surely there's going to be a better ending. You know, we talked about like the hope and the laughter and the sort of joy that existed next to the terror, you know, is real. Think about pandemic. Yep. We were, we were like, oh, we're gonna go inside for two weeks. Even though we knew that wasn't true, we just were like two weeks. And then we were like cooking and trying to find joy. And then also secretly like terrified. I mean, that really informed us living through that period of time, informed just how that might have felt on a, the smallest level for them. But that also that also fed into us working with the actors and mm -hmm. saying, you know, you cannot play the end of the show. You have to stay in the struggle for hope. Um, and I think they found that very uh, helpful in in because as we as we know you know you you get through those things through your intimate relations but also through humor and through making light of it and things like that and and most people who we talk to about this series talk about they were surprised that there was so much humor and meep when you meet her in her 90s in these interviews is a fucking hoot and very funny. And I can't believe that that happened to her when she became 80 years old. She was always that way. So right. you want to bring that life to the story because, I mean, as Joan is fond of saying, she doesn't like olden times. And if you're going to get an audience to relate, not only relate to the characters, but really feel as if they could be in their circumstance. There can be no barrier between the audience and the characters. And so things that fed into language and choices for wardrobe and what can we do to bring this story right into the audience so that that question of what would I do in those circumstances is constantly there without you having to say it all the time. Got it, got it. Um, so let's talk a little bit um, about the research for this show. Do you remember, you know, when you knew you were kind of like pursuing it, what was like the, where did you start? What was like the first, like the first? And, well, um, you, know, and you, you start with, you start with the big kind of, um, the big like histories of the time. 
Uh, we were very affected by images. There are some wonderful Dutch collections of images from Amsterdam during the war. Um, and then there are these seminal books like the destruction of the Dutch Jews. And there are also museum references. There's a resistance museum in Amsterdam, which is great. Um, we made a bunch uh, of trips to Amsterdam. We read everybody's book, you know, Meep had a book and Bap had a book and Ed, the books about here's who turned the Franks in. Like we just read everything. And then all of the sisters of Auschwitz, the, you know, everything, you know, we had many years cause we're working on other shows at the time. Um, but certain things that I remember during our research that struck me, one thing at the resistance museum and maybe people know this, I didn't know this, um the the yellow stars they the jews were told they had to put the yellow stars on their clothing but they had to buy the yellow stars themselves like mm -hmm. they had to pay for them and i was like wait like they're already being marginalized and stripped of their jobs and stripped of their they can't go to school and you got to pay for your own yellow star so like the the crazy bureaucracy I could was fascinating, you know, like little details like that just just helped us sort of imagine a modern telling of this. But you also you come across these stories that are tangential to what the Franks were going through, like the stories of the nurses like smuggling the babies out and putting them on the tram. And the story of Café de Mange, which was this gay, the first gay bar in Europe, where there was a resistance cell led by an artist, a gay artist. And you begin to accumulate these things and you're always saying, I'm gonna tell the story of the Franks and me, but at the same time, I wanna tell the story of Jan and what's going on outside of the annex. And so these things begin to accumulate, the story of the baby in the drawer and things like that. And while Jan, as Joan said, was very secretive about exactly what he did during the war, we based a lot of the things that we saw him doing on what would the, what would resistance uh, uh, fighters do with his job. The thing that made him valuable to the resistance was as a social worker, he could get he could go to any apartment in the city and get access to it. So to move money, to take photographs to parents who were hiding, because many times parents and children were separated in different places in hiding, to do things like that, that's the kind of work he would be doing. And we know that he was recruited into the resistance because there was a cell at his work. Um, right. So so yeah, you, you, you start accumulating all these things and taking notes about, I don't know how this is gonna fit in, but it's going to fit in somewhere. So there were a lot of things Meep said in this interview, and she said something else in this interview, but Meep's story really hadn't been sort of all these pieces hadn't been put together in one timeline. And one thing that I, that, that we were able to sort of put together was we knew that Meep and Jan had hid these nurses and we ab were able through Facebook and making a connection, we contacted their sort of relatives like a mm -hmm. great niece or something. And so we were able to then get letters and, you know, it just took a long time, but we had little mini discoveries along the way that were really exciting. And, and then there were little things that Meep said in passing where like, for example, when she said, my my um, foster mother was disappointed when I started dating Jan because she had hoped that I would marry my foster brother. And so that, once you read that, you're like, oh, that's gold. You gotta put that in the show. Mm -hmm. And that's a great way of having that inciting incident for this young girl, you know? And that's, I mean, 
that's so much information that you're trying to like keep up with and all these books you're reading and all this stuff. I always like to ask this when talking about research, how, how did you um, keep up with everything? Uh, did you like, you know, some people have wikis, giant binders. What was your like method? I mean, we kept a, it's, it's funny because when we started working with um, Nat Geo, they have what they call their coterie of PhDs, which is, if you're doing a historical show for them, you have to vet all the history past their people. And so they said, when we first started working with them, we would like to see your bibliography. And so I sent it to them and they're like, wow, this is much, because then they've got to go read it all. They're like, this is much more than we're used to. And I was like, I haven't even sent you the original historical documents the films and the podcasts that's coming in a whole separate thing so they were like okay you know what you're doing and and that really helps you when you are ultimately because we had to ultimately talk to the relatives of many of the people we were depicting and they while there's a certain amount in the show of creative license just because we don't know what conversations were had or things like that. And we put Meep and Jan in situations that they might not have been in. Um, they were reassured by the fact that when we got there, we knew what we were talking about. Um, next question is, so in writing this pilot, how, does, how, how do you think this differs when you're writing a pilot for a limited series versus a pilot for an entire uh, ongoing series? Like, what do you think the differences might be? It was really, uh, you know the story you're telling. You sort of, you know, this, I mean, this one has an end, a mm. tragic end. And so um, we knew we wanted to tell that story and our North Star was honoring the people whose story we were telling, you know? And so we wanted, for instance, you know, in the diary, and because she's 13, you know, is sometimes very snarky about her mother. She's sometimes snarky about um, the dentist. <laughs> and we got an opportunity, um, you know, and we knew we wanted to take the time to sort of give those people their due. Do you know what I mean? Like to flesh out Edith Frank's point of view and the dentist's point of view, you know. So, so we, we were, it's such a gift to sort of know the end, you know. I know we all like want series that go for a majillion years, but there are certain series that just are this. And when you know it's this, you get to just do it right. You don't have to string it along, you know. So that felt, Kind of like this this nice thing to know. But we did, I mean, that said, we did go down dead ends. We did, there was for a long time, there's, you can find this on, on, on YouTube. Meep appeared at the 1996 Academy Awards um, because this documentary, Anne Frank remembered, won best, Academy, best documentary. So little Meep Geese goes up on stage and is introduced to Hollywood who give her a standing ovation. And you see like there's Meryl Streep and there's Brad Pitt. And we were like, well, that's where we should start. We should start there and go back. And that was in, you know- That was that in was a in million drafts. Right. And we were gonna do that, but then it just kept feeling like, who cares? This yeah. And, and yeah. you know, do you really wanna see like Helen Mirren playing Meep, and then you go back and you see Bell Powell. Mm, not really. I mean, now that so, you say it. Now that you say it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, we did, it was funny. We had one kind of misstep when we originally pitched the first episode to, to catch it, I think. Or was the first episode or a pitch? And it was just wrong. Mm -hmm. And then pretty soon after that, once we kind of came... And I think it was Joan's idea. She was like, I think it's a bike ride. I think the bike ride is is the framing device of the pilot. 
And originally in the in the original pilot, I think it's in the script, we keep going back to the to Meep and and Margot at the checkpoint. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when we cut it, actually, we did the first cut of the pilot. We were like, this is it keeps pulling us out of we had we our, had we had so in the I think finished cut. I don't know what it, I don't remember what it is in the script, but there were many more times we flashed back to that checkpoint. Right. But in the cut, it was like too too jumbly and too confusing. But the 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 device of the bike ride and the tension of the bike ride, I think, provided an awesome kind of. Framework. And it was also a great way to, I think, start a story. the The promise of the show is that this is a different way to look at the story of Anne Frank. And so to have a, the pilot of that series be about Anne and Margot, who, who in the diary gets short shrift and you barely can get a sense of her, but to have those two people kind of be the big characters in it, we thought was really exciting as well. And, and I did not know until we really started digging in that Meep, was the one who took Margot and Margot was the first person in hiding. And so that also felt like that day of just getting her into hiding felt like the tension point that you wanted. And the other thing that, as we were talking about the pilot, the other thing that kept up coming up was, okay, once you get them into hiding, what next? <laughs> Your entire focus is just getting them there. And right. then, I mean, Meep and Jan weren't spies. They had no training in this. They were making it up as they went along. And so to, to kind of take the audience through that whole journey and drop them at the point of, oh, fuck, what do we do now? <laughs> we felt was a great way to kind of kick, kick you off into watching the next thing. And the, Absolutely. You know, the uh -huh. joy of network television is it, teaches you how to cliffhang so yeah. <laughs> yeah um so let's um let's go ahead and get um the script pages on screen um we've got casey who's going to be our scroller today i just want to um oh my god look at that third i know yeah the, i actually this is my question i want to hold um, <laughs> on on all these these uh color-coded revisions because i think it's really really helpful for our up-and-coming tv writers out there to see this um <laughs> and uh can you can you speak um a little bit to like the revisions that are listed here and like what what kinds of things necessitated like doing a revision yeah, I mean, obviously you get that white production draft out and you're all happy snappy and you feel like you've wrestled this thing to the ground and then you're showing it to people. And I, I mean, we write pretty intense outlines. So our first drafts don't get torn up all that much. Mm -hmm. Our outlines get torn up a hell of a lot, right? Um. But there were things about condensing and can you make this moment more powerful? I remember in the production draft, um, we didn't sort of have Jan come to the annex at the end. And, Ka and Nat Geo was like, we're sort of pitching this or we're sort of telling a story of a marriage and we feel like we need to bring him to you know, the annex at the end and leave on an image of the two of them together. Especially so since- like that. Yeah, especially since the emotional conflict in the show, in the latter half of the of this episode is between Meep and Jan mm -hmm. and her not telling him what she'd kind of signed up for. And you wanted to know that even though they had had that huge fight, that he was going to be there for her throughout. And then the other thing was, you want the audience to know that he knows what's going on. He he knows he knows they're in hiding. He knows where they are. So bringing him there at the end was, I think, a great- Yeah, a great one, thing, 
one thing that we wanted to talk that that was important for us as a married couple, we're a married couple, mm -hmm. um, is that we wanted to, and and we're a married writing couple. So imagine the fights we've had, okay? <laughs> um, and we really wanted this marriage to be real and feel real without having to resort to fakeness. Like you always wanted to feel that these people loved one another and that they were going to stay together. So we didn't want fake jeopardy of like, if you do this, I'm going to leave you. But within the, it's, it's their first year of marriage and this is what they're going through. You know, we, we wanted to talk about just the stressors that would put on, on a marriage. Totally. Um, so let's um let's like let's scroll a little um to um arguably the most important page of any script which is page 1 um uh, <laughs> um i mean you've touched on this a little bit um but can you talk about um the decision to sort of open with the family sending the two of them off and specifically the first line do what meep says well, so imagine being a father and you're sending your kid off with somebody. Like, we wanted to set it up like, I'm Otto Frank and I'm trusting Meep. Like, we're mm -hmm. about to tell a story where I, Otto Frank, this this girl has earned my trust, mm -hmm. all right? So you listen to me now, Margo, you you do what Meep says, because we're going to tell a story. And, and the whole story, by the way, was driven in part by the fact that when we learned that after the war, Otto lived with Meep and Jan for seven years, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it was like, oh, this started off as employer-employee and became something else. You know, and part of the story is what were these two people to each other? What were Otto and Meep to one another? And so that was really intentional, you know, to, just to say, I trust Meep. And now I, I need you to listen to Meep. And in a sense, the you could think of the of this pilot as answering your question. Right. Yes, because yes, yes. we flash back to see how these two people came to know each other and what got them into this circumstance where he needs to say this to his child. Got it. Got but it. also, like, I remember thinking, wow, like, what must that have been like on that morning? You know, I'm really drawn always to the heightened. Margot has to go into hiding today. But really, like, whenever I have a heightened event, my kid is going off to college, uh, you know, you find out some really bad news, you still have to eat breakfast and, and clean up your plates. Like, I'm, I love the mundane next to the heightened. It just makes it feel relatable and real to me. And so the idea of Edith sort of saying, she hasn't eaten, have, have some toast. Right, right. And what that might really be like was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's, um, let's scroll a little bit to, uh, I think the next page is three, um, where we see, um, there we go. Uh, where we see, uh, Meep and Margo leave on the bicycles toward the security checkpoint. Um, and also here, um, we have, uh, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but we have um, our first flashback um, to 1934 uh, with Meep and her friend Tess. Um, I think it's really cool. I just want to like, you know, people who are watching this to so just note like there's like an, uh, that it, it flashes back to Meep and Tess also on bicycles. That's really elegant and, and uh, well done. Um, uh, what I want to know um, is kind of as you were writing this, um, first of all, when you're writing, who does what? Um, and also, how did you manage uh, these timelines, specifically in this pilot script? It was hard. 
<laughs> we have to cover so much freaking time. I was very stressed about it. I mean, but the inter the interesting thing about this is, is that this is not the way the pilot goes. Right. We had the we had the pieces that we shot, and then when we got into editing, we totally changed them all up. Um, we and I'll tell that. you, I'll tell you, the the stress of the time, like <laughs> I'm such a like, I want everybody to follow it. But we had just watched Unorthodox. Do you remember that limited? Yep. And the the ease that that series took with jumping back and forward with time, sort of trusting the audience that they'll get it without making a big Chiron freaking story out of it. You know, there was just some ease and that gave me sort of confidence that we could do some moving back and forth of time. Um, but we Chiron the hell out of it. Just well, we didn't actually. I mean, because ultimately what we ended up with was Meep and Margo get to the checkpoint. Then we flash back to Meep. And then we tell Meep's whole story until we get back to the checkpoint. Mm -hmm. And and when we do, when you did it that way, and and Meep's story from the time she was a girl waking up and going downstairs to her parents and she's drunk and you know a party girl and all of that, that allows you once you have the initial Chiron of 1932 to just run all the way to the invasion and not Chiron again. Because as you're telling it, you're you, the audience, are assuming we're moving forward in time. And because we're not going back and then this way and going back and then this way, I don't need Chirons. I trust that we're moving forward. Time is moving forward. So that then when you have the invasion in 42, it's you're like, no, 40. When you have the invasion in 40, then then you're like, okay, I get it. But it took it, it was it was um what's that like I was white knuckling it thinking yeah. can I trust the audience to go on this ride? It was well, also for us as writers this was very we had never done anything like this before, you know we uh, as playwrights you obviously you have every choice you can anything can happen. But then we went from that to doing network TV and network TV operates with pretty strict rules in terms of storytelling mm -hmm. in terms of how long the scenes usually are how many scenes per act you're always going out when you go to commercial you always have some kind of cliffhanger act out to kind of make sure the audience doesn't change the channel and this in a way having up to an hour as opposed to 42 minutes and having the structure be whatever you want it to be it was much closer in some ways to playwriting Hmm. Oh. Um, could we gonna move on to page four? Okay, see, let's see. So our question here at the caddy corner. Um, so a lot of uh, is your description here is so economical, which I find we find kind of like rare for like historical projects like this. Um my question is, was there a time where where these paragraphs were much thick, much, much thicker? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't really? think so. I'm not much for lots of that stuff. You no, know, I, I, I also know the actors don't love lots of that stuff. You know, it sort of, uh, and I want, I, I want this to be a great read. And I find when I'm reading a script, big, thick chunks of mm -hmm. action are daunting to me. Yeah. So no, I like to keep it lean and mean. <laughs> but I think I think that I think that what Joan um just said is really important because, and this was something that somebody said to us early in our career, every piece of paper that you produce is a sales document. Mm -hmm. And and when you write a script, it's gotta be a good read because that's how people are going to be experiencing this. And once you get into production, we worked with, I mean, I knew that we had chosen the right um, production uh, designer because he had done as much research as I have. And so we were able to talk 
in a very detailed way about what everything should look like and how much wear and tear should there be and all of that stuff he and i were on the same page so it didn't have to be on this page right but you know like if you look at the part where it says meep and test jitterbug and lindy hop i mean <laughs> i think when i was first writing it i was like oh my god how am i gonna write all that choreography of where they then i was like yo i don't need to do that the director <laughs> will figure that out <laughs> good call yeah <laughs> okay, so Moving on to page five, uh, let's see, we see uh, in this page, we see uh, Meep and Jan have a bit of a meet cute. Uh, he's been <laughs> at the bar and she wants to buy him a drink. Uh, can you talk about writing this? And uh, and also, is there a significance to uh, Jan reading the Kafka metamorphosis about a man who wakes up and thinks, you know, one day he realizes he's a bug? Well, <laughs> we, need, we, we needed a meet and we knew she was a party girl and she she would like like you always want to go off something real and everybody said that me she was always describing herself as a peppy dancer so we were <laughs> like okay modern parlance is she's sort of a party girl okay i get that and we wanted this meeting and and we wanted me uh yawn to be an actual nerd not a sort of a tv nerd like an actual boy who would read a book in a bar and so I had to figure out what that was. And I was just researching like what books were happening in Europe at that time. And the metamorphosis was a big one. And I love that book. So I just, I just used it. And then the themes of the metamorphosis really like clicked with what Jan was going through, just feeling like, and I, I imagine what all young people, it really spoke to me about young people, right? These are two young people and they have limited circumstances. I mean, they're not wealthy. They don't, uh, they, they want a job and they, you know, they don't really know what they want, but like they, they have a yearning and the metamorphosis speaks to that yearning. Yeah. Right. You know, and we wanted, obviously you want these people once again, to feel relatable, to feel yeah. like, and that, and the fact that this is the book that he comes back to, he's read it a couple of times and, this is this is his manifesto is i'm He's not going to be saying, this guy who are the kind of people that would say yes immediately you know <laughs> they're people like you want to begin to lay the groundwork for who are these people that would say yes i mean we, we have them all around us like it, it, it like who are the people you know you know, and they have sort of a bigger idea of the world and and dreams and desires that go beyond their reg, you know. So that was a little bit where that decision to have Jan be a reader in a in a bar came from. Cool. If we can move on to page seven. Um, so here Meep is hungover. Let's see, let's get to it here. Okay. Um, you know, with her family, and they start in on how she needs to get a job, and then they're worried about her. And then, um, then on page nine, um, they present her with the, the the idea that if she can't find a job, then she should just find a husband. And since she's not, she's you know she's not going to find a husband in a pub, she should marry Cass, uh, who is her adopted brother. Um, this, I think you, I think you covered this, but like we just wanted to know, like, like this was you true. know because you, what you also do is, is you paint me into a corner, well, yeah, and pages. And so, yeah. you know, which which we love. Um, so like, but but this this was true. Like that was a basically the basically the question, right? This is like this was a this is all true because of what <laughs> she you never know. she never she never kind of coughed up who the brother was that she was supposed to marry. Um, and the other thing we knew is because we knew that we wanted to tell the story of Cafe de Mange, and we know that the history of LGBTQ people is a part of the Dutch resistance and obviously a part of all history. We were like, she has six foster brothers. <laughs> Statistically, one of them has to be gay. It's just <laughs> the way it's gay. It, it has to be that way. And so the idea that Kaz was this guy who from childhood 
was the one that she was closest to. Also, we knew in in future was going to give us a way to get her in that bar in a way that would be somewhat unexpected. Mm -hmm. So that fed into the question of who is Kaz and how can he play a part in the show, not only because of that, but also because part of having the secret is having to keep the secret from your family, from the people that you are closest to. And what does that do to your personal relationships? But this so. is a true bit as well, that a neighbor lady sold jam door to door and got me the interview with Otto Frank. Mm, okay. Okay. Um, so let's, let's actually um, move uh, to page 12 uh with Meep and Kaz they have this lovely scene um on a canal bridge where he's like you should go ahead and jump <laughs> um but we've we've established like you know he's um probably more into helping her get a job than uh marry her um and I just I love um that he's helping her kind of prepare her CV at the, just the you know like my grades weren't terrible <laughs> my technical skills non-existent <laughs> emerging um she's just such a such a plucky like underdog um and i wonder if you could talk about developing meep as a protagonist like with your background on shows like grays do you have anything sort of in your toolkit that you like put into practice on something like this hmm. um well i knew she needed to go from here to somewhere so uh one thing that struck me in our research was um, she also wrote a diary during the war, mm -hmm. right? People were encouraged to keep diaries and she wrote a diary for like three days, which is what I would do. I would always start a diary and write it for about three days. And she spoke in one interview of being a little jealous of Anne in that Anne kept it up and Anne had enough self-possession to feel like she had something to say and me didn't. And that was very telling to me, that detail of feeling like, first of all, Anne and Margot are educated. They're from a higher class. And so I always really imagined that Meep was a little bit like sort of, you know, the way you can be intimidated by people from a different class, like it's, they're educated in a different way. And so that told me a lot about me, that she maybe had some sort of, of her own self-esteem struggles. And and so that that helped us place her at a place where she was just sort of like lost at the beginning and didn't feel like she had anything special about her. And we're going to show through the series what's special about her what Otto Frank in this first interview saw in her that she doesn't yet see in herself. Right. That's, that's a perfect note um, to go to this first interview. Um, because it turns out um, Kaz had this woman set Meep up uh, at OPECTA with this interview with Otto Frank. Um, so here's where we meet him. She interviews with him. Um, Talk about, I mean, this is like a, you know, it, since their relationship is like the crux of like the whole series, talk about writing um, this scene and sort of developing their connection as characters. Well, I think the, the thing that you come away with when you read about the two of them is how much strangely, even keeping in mind everything that Joan was talking about, about the class differences, mm -hmm. how much they had in common. She was uh, an immigrant. She was from Vienna. She spoke German. Um, and she, we don't really show this as much, but she, for Otto and Edith and all of their friends who were German emigres to Amsterdam because of Hitler, she was this wonderful resource who could speak their language, teach them the customs, work with them on how to fit into D Dutch culture, and, um, and the fact that she was, I mean, Otto famously described her and Jan as our Dutch friends, 
whenever he would talk about what that the, they would have these kind of Saturday or Sunday salons with all their friends and they would have me Benyan over and they would have topics to talk about that were specific to being a Dutch emigre. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was a big part of their relationship. So, so seeing that, and then the other thing that I think is so great about this scene that Joan did is, is the um, surprise that Otto has. He keeps getting kind of thrown off his balance in terms of what he's expecting versus what she brings him in terms mm -hmm. of she keeps hitting him with this, like, I'm going to have to marry my brother if I don't get this job. But we yeah. also <laughs> learned from our research that essentially this scene is real. He made her come in day after day and make jam. And she was like, what the hell am I making jam for? <laughs> and he finally admitted that it was for the housewives. Yeah. And so and you can, you can actually go online and, and find... Uh, they made a commercial uh, for Opecta uh, that you can find online that um, was shown in movie theaters of Meep literally at that same little stove making jam with the with the uh, pectin. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah and I mean, pages 14 and 15, you kind of covered this, but it, it does feel, scroll up a little bit, um, uh, Casey, to 15. Um, because it it does feel like very karate kid ish, like text on my And this is work. one that really we wrote it, but I knew that it was going to be in the direction and the the music, and I knew it was going to be montagey and fun in that right. Bobby way. But it is, it is that it is that wax on wax off idea right. uh, <laughs> of the slow build to get her to the point where she's no longer intimidated with him. She marches into his office, slams the jam down and says, I'm done. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you accomplished that. That's, That's great. great. Um, so I think um, let's move, let's jump ahead a little bit um, to page 20. Um, after about a year has passed and Meep and Mr. Frank have this have developed this really good report and on this particular day, it's his birthday. Um, and she explains Mrs. Frank called and asked her to get him a cake. Um, and I think what follows across the next three pages is like one of the critical scenes of the pilot. Um, and uh, they've gone to this little bakery and they're talking and they're getting to know each other. Um, and there's some pretty extensive monologues here where they like feel comfortable kind of sharing this personal stuff. Um, and monologues are hard. Like, I do you guys have an approach? Uh, how do how do you approach you know writing kind of these like confessional? Um, and what was your approach here? Um, I think they're 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 not hard to me. It's hard to not constantly do them. You know, like <laughs> they're so I, they're so lovely. We knew we wanted to um, tell the story of how she was an or uh, adopted by her family. And so we wanted these two people to find some similarities. And honestly, you know, it's a, a, as writers, you'll all notice where exposition is shoved in places, you know, and this was a perfect <laughs> scene to tell us a lot about our characters you know, they're getting to know one another. So we get the opportunity to know things about them. But but the detail of it, the detail of like the tennis game, his history as a banker, all of that stuff, obviously, once again, is research. And so it's a matter of you having this pool of information and then you can just cherry pick what is going to help in the scene. Totally. You know, and then you get in there and the actors usually want way less. You know, you'll give them a chunk like this big and they're like, I think it can be just one line. <laughs> like, <laughs> <in that interview. laughs> um, I just want to like hold sort of uh, in the middle of 22 here. Um, just her, you know, talking about how she could have gone back to 
uh, to Austria, but you know, she, she doesn't really remember her mom anymore and feels guilty about forgetting her. And I just love, um, Otto's line about like, you know, you pay her back by living a life that's worthy of her sacrifice. Um, not a question, just a like, oh, that's I, really good. that line, <laughs> like, you know, you're going through for cuts and you're like, am I being too writery here? And then Liev was like, what happened to that line? I love that line. We're putting that line in. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> and I'm so glad that he said that. I'm so glad because when I watch it, it's the crux of it. I'm like, how could you have been that line? What is wrong with me? <laughs> um, so let's go to, um, I think it's page 20, uh, 22A and then like uh, page 23. I just want to touch on this briefly because this is like a what I would describe as like a re-meet cute um for for Jan and Meep um and Meep sees the ad for the kittens she goes to the lady's house turns out that Jan lives there and I just love um especially in rom-coms when when couples meet again somewhere <laughs> somewhere else and I love that he's mad at her um for ditching him and we've sort of touched on this already but can you talk a little bit about um just adding that kind of like levity and humor to some, you know, it's just, it's such a, you know, if you just look at it, you know, from the outside, it's such a dark time in history and yeah. yeah. Well, it was so important, right? That these be real people who have real feelings and she ditched him in a bar, you know? Yeah. Um, so it just felt really fun and funny. And we knew we had to like, kind of get them together. So this just seemed perfect. And we knew we wanted to highlight the cat because the cat was a big piece of Anne's life. And so this is not how they met, you know, but we kind of gave the cat moment. And it so also it also allowed us to tell the story of Jan and how he was working in a in a fucking office and hated it mm -hmm. and then decided that he wanted to help people and he became a social worker. And so you know, it allows us to re-meet him not as this nerdy guy at a bar, but as somebody who actually has some real depth to him. And I think that's what draws Meep in, is he's able to, in a weird way, make himself as vulnerable as she is. Oh, yeah. Um, well, that leads perfectly into kind of my next um, question. Uh, at the top of 25, um, Jan says, you know, Kafka once said the meaning of life is that it ends. Um, and he goes on to say, you know, we only have this life right here, right now. Um, and then on 26, you know, he he has that monologue, you know, where he talks about how he left his boring textiles job and also his wife um, and now works as a social worker. Um, and he hasn't like technically gotten divorced yet. And Meep wonders if they kissed, would it be infidelity? And he says uh technically legally probably um and then when they kiss she's like we just broke the law um and I, I just bring all of this up um to to ask like when you're doing your extensive outlines um and like and writing this is are you like deliberately thinking about like theme and like how how you know adding something like this makes them the type of characters it's like oh yeah like they would break the law for something that they when I'm outlining, I'm basically writing the scene. Like I imagine the whole thing. And yes, I'm always sort of uncovering, layering, thinking of theme, finding ways to to call back and things like that. And theme actually, you know, we always write with theme. If it's Grey's Anatomy or Fire Country or whatever show we've created, that's a big part of of how we break story and how you choose story. That story in your episode has to in some way relate to theme. Otherwise it stuff begins to feel random. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, here doctor. this was true and it was a very important piece to who Meep was is that she, that Jan had been married, she didn't care. She had zero desire to get married. It wasn't important to her. And for a woman at that time, that's really telling. That's like a, a modern kind of sensibility that we wanted to show. And that's also, to go back to research, 
something that we discovered mm. that they didn't talk about ever. So it was this hidden part of them that was never a part of her story. And you can read- But Tony, Jan's marriage, his first yeah. marriage. Yeah. His first marriage. And the fact that they were living in sin for a long time and that that was the reason they did not marry mm -hmm. until much later was because he was married to someone else. Um, but it also makes them feel much more modern in a way. Absolutely. Um, cool. We're going to um, move on to page 27. So um, let's see. So here we have uh, Edith Frank's description, which we love. 45 elegant, opinionated, doesn't suffer fools. Um, so the question about this script is that uh, a lot of these characters, you know, have been covered in film, TV, you know, whatever, and endlessly. So how, talk about how you find your your voice for them, like, you know, for each of the characters. Yeah, it's really tricky, isn't it? I mean, um, and it was really important that that not every, you know, you can sort of get into bad habits of every character sounds the same. And I was so concerned, especially because you've got, you know, the younger people like Anne and Margot and Meep and Jan. But then you have the older people, sort of the parents, they're immigrants. They're going to be a little bit more formal and stiff and they're not going to speak as freely as Meep. And I wanted that. Like, I didn't want everybody to be just sort of the same version of, 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 of whatever. And so um, thank you for noticing it. I mean, it was just like a, um, it was, it was something I was working on in my own writing at the time, trying to really make, you know, Otto Frank was a guy who was more reserved. So I had to honor that. And how do I make sure the character is interesting if he's holding so much back? I mean, it was a real, it was a real exercise for me. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Then um, page 29, um, let's see. So we have uh, the note describing to see Young and Frank. Let's see, we're in Yeah, there we are. Speaking in German, just that's, that's kind of a nice touch that, you know, that, that they did that. Um, and here, uh, Meet brings them a cat. And I think I think you kind of touched on this, but did Meet really, did you say she didn't get him the cat, right? She did no. not get, she okay, did not okay. get them the cat, no. Okay. That was a question. Um, because the, cat the cat, the cats, the cats is the cat going. So here's what happened. In reality, the scene of like, I can't bring the cat to hiding was real and important. And it felt like for Anne, it was just the worst part about this. And so one of the notes we got early on was we'd like that cat and the importance of the cat to be laid in earlier. And so this is where, where this idea came from. Right, yep. because it feels to me a little bit like the way the the, the bicycle trip is structured, yeah. it's almost like this is a slightly structured thing as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And once again, it shows Meep doing what we were talking about earlier, which is helping these people who are scared and overwhelmed begin to feel a little bit comfortable in their new home. Right. And because of her personal interest and, and what her mother told her to get her on that train to go to Amsterdam when she was 12, she gets this idea that I can bring this cat in and this is going to make the girls feel, you know, feel yeah. like their new home is someplace they want to be. Right. It works really well. So moving on to page 32. Um, so we love, by the way, we love, you guys have brilliant cuts. So uh, here's one on, on page 32 where uh, Meep is talking to Jan. They meet they meet the Franks and the Van Pels, and uh, she's priming him at like like if she were you know going to go see her own family, which suggests that you know the Franks have become her surrogate family. Um, then towards the middle of, of the page, she says these are fancy people, and then they're they're all Jewish, so don't mention you know who. And of course, immediately it cuts to her. <laughs> He's a giant narcissistic man, baby. Um, <laughs> another really funny moment. Um, uh, well, no it was uh, it was 
history dictated that one. I mean, it was like, let's not talk about such and such, right. our current president. <laughs> and it would be like, God damn it, this guy. <laughs> yeah. So, but um, yeah, Susanna Fogel actually is the one who said, I think we should cut right from don't mention you know who. Um, um, actually, you know I had who. said, I had written don't mention Hitler and Carolyn uh, Bernstein at Nat Geo was like, wouldn't it be more fun if she said, you know who? Anyway, so this was all very collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so let's get into that scene. Um, at, the, at the top of page 34, you know, they get into this discussion about whether they think Hitler will invade the Netherlands. And me, you know, rather naively insists he will not, uh, that the Netherlands was neutral during the Great War and that the country saved her life. Um, and you can see why she has this viewpoint, but obviously the Franks and the Van Pels are um, a lot more skeptical. Um, can you talk about writing this kind of um, political discussion scene and how you sort of put yourself into that um, and write from all their different kind of viewpoints? Yeah, I mean, it's fun because um first of all i had to do a little research mm -hmm. and think like what would their viewpoints be and i mean it was I, I gotta tell you think about it it was so much about you know the election we had just lived through like do you really think he'll be this way no no way once he gets elected he'll be fine like mm -hmm. the human desire to go it's going to be okay when, and then you've got people who have lived through, yo, it's not going to be okay. You know, so it was just, it just felt really like a real conversation. And yet I had to do a bunch of little research on like what the strat what the war strategy was and stuff. What was the you know, scene like that, by the way, that scene, I avoided and avoided and avoided because it seemed really scary. You know, lots mm. of people talking lots of viewpoints and it probably took me a full day but then it turned out to be just really fun to write and once again it was one of those the genesis of the idea was i think Otto told the story that when they were having one of those salons that we were talking about a friend of his slipped out the door because they were talking politics because these things always devolved into talking about Hitler and talking about politics. And his friend slipped out the door and then knocked on the front door and they opened it. And there he was holding a comb up as a Hitler mustache. And everybody laughed. Because, of course, you're gonna. Because you feel safe. Wow. Oh, man. <laughs> uh well, and I I, I want to note, uh, cause, just because I think it's funny, the line like it, towards the bottom of the page, you know, no one is eating my uh, my nice cheese balls except the nice quiet <laughs> Dutchman. Um, and on to page 35, you know, like Han or Jan, sorry, Jan um, st <laughs> stays out of the fight, um, you know, and, and, you know, he's he says like the cheese balls are delicious rather than, you know, uh, saying what he thinks about Hitler invading. Um and I love where uh, me here at the top of the page says, you see a true Dutchman, he knows how to stay out of a fight. And boom, there's another one of those cuts um, where, you know, me and Otto are standing outside the OPECTA office offices and, um, you know, there's two lines of Nazi soldiers uh, marching by. Well, this is, this was an interesting scene because we didn't write this scene until we had put together a rough cut of the first episode. Originally, we went to we went from he knows how to stay out of a fight to Meep walking down the street and there are kind of Nazis around and then we see the swastika in her sunglasses. Mm. But when we saw the cut, we were like, guys, we don't have enough Nazis. There's mm -hmm. a there's a definite lack of Nazis. And we felt what like mean, what he the, means is the the fear and the sort of the the reality of the invasion. Did mm -hmm. we it felt like we skipped over something that we like we knew we didn't want to see. Like at one point they talked about. I mean, this is real. Like the day of the invasion, 
They were at work, everybody's staring out their window at the Germans marching down the street. So this is a version of what's real. And we talked about, do we have me go to damn square and watch the invasion and all this stuff, but we didn't have the money or the time. So this is- <laughs> It works, it really works. So yeah, I think we shot that. I, I shot this scene because uh, it was after Susanna had left to go do another project. And and it was literally just a pickup of, and it's that old adage of, you know, you've got 40 guys and they march and then they run around the camera and then they march and then they <laughs> run around the camera. But, but yeah, just to kind of get that kind of visceral. So we thought that he knows how to stay out of a fight. You cut to like jack boots moving down cobblestones. Kind of gives you that feeling of, oh shit, this is real. That's amazing. Well, and and on to page 36. Um, when I rewatched the pilot the other day, I noticed this scene wasn't in it, but but it's I think it's worth kind of talking about. Um you have this scene where where Meep is buying flowers and the German soldier, you know, asks for her opinion on what what flowers he should get his girlfriend. Um, can you just touch on this for a little bit? Just uh where this scene yeah, came from? I mean, we wanted to show just how embedded these Nazis had become in, you know, Amsterdam. And they were there and they were, you know, hanging out and buying flowers. And this was the period of time where they were like don't worry, we're nice. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted that bit to show that Amsterdam was now infiltrated to show passage of time, to show Otto is now in the next scene wearing his yellow star. And uh, and we ended up cutting it just cause it didn't, it didn't work that well in the cut, but like, I like the idea of the scene. Right. For sure. So I'm uh, moving on to page 37. So we got a few pages to cover here, um, but 37. So there, the you know the workers are making fun of a you know the what is it banana pudding you know the the letter they got banana jam. Oh banana right right <laughs> I mean right 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 and uh, and and Mr. Frank he's in a terrible mood and we see that for the we see for the first time he's wearing a, a yellow star. Then uh, on page uh, 38. Um, you know, he says, he tells me, come see me before you go. Um, and then page, uh, yeah, scroll over to page 39, um, Casey. Then we have like, so we now here we have like the beginning of what feels like a inciting incident for the, for the whole miniseries. Um, and then on page 40, the next page, so Otto explains to me that, you know, he knows uh, like, that uh, Nathan Strauss, who works at the Roosevelt administration, the, even with this contact they have in America, their passport, you know, applications have been turned down, or their visas have been turned down. Um, so a lot of people don't really know a lot about the U.S. immigration policies at the time. So, like, can you talk a little bit about, like, how you folded this kind of information into the, into the, uh, into the script here? Well, it's, it's funny because I was on one of the first pieces of publicity I did for the show was I was on a panel about Anne Frank with um, Lynn, what's her name, who works with Ken Burns, who did. Oh, who did, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, America and the Holocaust, which is their mm -hmm. most recent documentary. They start the documentary, that whole multiple documentary. They start with this story, with this, the fact that Otto Frank could not get his family into America even though he knew one of the wealthiest men in the country who worked in the Roosevelt administration and the walls against Jews entering America were so unbreachable that even he couldn't get him in. And that to us felt like, and we know that, that actually this was a multi-pronged process of auto from the time the Nazis invaded, trying to get his family out of the country. Um, but we felt like, A, that was one of the, one of those pieces of research that you want to have in the show. But also, um, I, I really feel like this is the heart and soul of, in some ways, the entire series is this scene. Mm -hmm. because this is the scene that not only has, shows you 
how deeply uncomfortable it is for Otto to ask her this, but how she instantly says yes. Yep. And even when he says, think about it, she's like, I don't have to think about it. Yes. Right. Um, and, you know, I think the, 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 I, 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 it's, I think one of my favorite scenes in the whole series, just the way Joan wrote it and also the way that uh, our actors were able to kind of embody it so that you felt the accumulation of this relationship that you'd seen. You know, you have the kind of fun and and them getting closer and them at a cocktail party and you feel all of that stuff. Right. And then you see how this very proud man has to ask her this unthinkable thing. Mm -hmm. And how yeah. she never, ever makes him feel self-conscious about asking. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I love in the description that it, it literally says their relationship has just changed. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In case you didn't know. <laughs> um, so over the next few pages after Meep um has without reservation, you know, committed committed to this, um, this next scene um on 44, we want to look at. Um, Meep is out with Tess. Um, and by the way, Tess is frustrated that uh Meep never told her that she got married. Um, and on 44, they pass by um, Coco's ice cream shop. Um, and in the description there, we see that it's boarded up. And Tess explains that some Nazis came in and started harassing some Jewish customers. Um, and the owner sprayed um, ammonia in the Nazis' faces. And they brought him out into the street and they shot him. Um, so this is definitely... Um, a steak razor moment right on the on the heels of her making this commitment and definitely like a what did I just get myself into moment um can you talk about including this um yeah well we wanted to show we wanted a counterpoint to Meep and so we invented the character of Tess now look we know Meep had friends but we don't know a lot about who they were but we imagine like we all have is when sort of friends have different kind of make different choices and have different points of view, what that does to a friendship. And so we wanted to have a friend who sort of was like, oh, come on. It's, it, it's you know, casual anti-Semitism, which I'm sure was just de rigueur. And what, how would Meep react to having this friend who just is casually anti-Semitic? And then when you call her on it, she's like, oh, come on. I, I didn't mean that. It just felt real and a yeah. uh, really important thing to kind of dig into. And this Coco's thing was real. So we wanted oh, wow. to, to have them walk by this real thing. Wow. Um, so, uh, so we can just kind of like breeze um by page 47 here because we're we're starting to run low on time um but there's another great cut you know where jan is like just don't mess with any nazis and you'll be okay um and it kind of cuts back to um you know she's she's getting margo across that checkpoint um and then um we get to 49 and um it's a flashback. Meep comes home. Um, she finds that Mr. Van Pels is there explaining that Margot got a letter and now they have to go into hiding tomorrow. Um, and it, it just creates this amazing tension where, um, you know, Meep is kind of unsure of how much Mr. Van Pels told Jan. Um, but I think I'm going to let, since we're, again, we're, we are starting to get into a time crunch here. Um, Javier, you ask your question. Yeah, so basically like pages, uh, what do we have, pages 50 to 54. Um, so we see that the tensions boiling over at the Frank house and, you know, we have an argument and uh, Otto tells her, don't talk about this in front of the kids. Um, you know, and, and, and it's just, it, it also feels like there's a big ticking clock here for them. Um, then uh, Casey scrolled down, uh, uh, to, we see this whole argument here, but the scroll down to page 54, um, so the family thinks that maybe they should go into hiding that night. And so on, when we get to page 54, after all of this, we have like, that's when we see me like in her heroic moment, right? So she's like she's volunteering to take Margot into hiding 
and uh, can you, can you, I mean, obviously she's our focus and can you talk about like this moment? Like, yeah, I mean, know. there's so much because um, it's all happening and Jan is like, uh, were you going to ask me? Like all of these things are building and then you go to the next argument between Jan and Meep where she's a little bit like, what was I supposed to do? And we knew we wanted a marital argument to happen on this night, right? right? As they're, you know, in reality, they had to make many trips wearing many layers of clothing. The fear you're walking by Nazis. I mean, it's, it's, it's there, but also you get home and you're mad at your wife. You're mad at your husband. We wanted a real marital argument butting up against this sort of high stakes moment. So that's where that came from. And also just the inherent comedy of them yep. looking like these kind of Michelin men walking around with in the middle of July with all of their all of the Frank's clothing on them. Right. Um, yeah, you know, that's... you're you're always looking for these kind of odd juxtapositions in scenes. If you can achieve that, then then you've really got something going on. And for the actors, it's great because they have an action in the scene. Yeah. They're taking off layers and layers and layers of clothes as they're having this massive fight. Right, and that, that was gonna be definitely a comment that, or a question I had about the joke of like the bras, the multiple bras, which we thought just went really like, went great great change of tone there. So we yeah. love that. Um, so pages uh, 58 to 59. Um, so this is, this, is, we, this is amazing. So Meep is so fast thinking on her feet. Like she lets the, she lets the air on the tire um you know to to kind of like and then when and then on page 59 you know so we know that there's a lot of nervousness and how is she going to get her across this checkpoint without her losing her mind and uh she gets her to talk about Anne and uh and so what what I love about this is like you know like it's you know I I guess you see this in life where you just kind of like if you're preoccupied thinking about something else and all of a sudden the event is over you know, and then so like, like I thought that was a great, great uh, solution to that problem because she's talking about it. They ride through, and oh my god, yeah, that was in the pitch from the beginning. Just like the, just smile, just smile, just talk about something. Just look at me, talk to me. And then right. Carolyn Bernstein again suggested because I had her talking about something else. She was like, "Let's give the audience a little bit of Anne. Like this is how we can bring Anne into the, the right." Show. Well, and also I think it tells a lot about like the two, how different the sisters yeah. are. Yeah. And then page 60, uh, as they breathe they breeze past, you know, maybe explains to the German soldier that, you know, they 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 have a flat, they can't stop because their boss will kill her. Her boss will <laughs> kill her. Um, so um like how did you like basically you, you touched on this, but how did you mentally get them to the checkpoint? Was there like was there like a written account of this or was this like something that you guys well, the, I mean, there was the written account and Meep was interviewed about the fear of the bike ride. The bike ride was really freaking scary and Margot was really terrified and they had to go by Germans and they had to like just the fear. And so we just heightened it by putting in this checkpoint. Checkpoints were there. I They didn't in real life have to go through this checkpoint, I don't think. But we just wanted a heightened version of what probably everyday life was like. Right. Got it. Um, so ultimately, um, so on page 61, um, Meep gets uh, Margot to the annex. Um, and this kind of like catches us up with where the other, you know, accounts of this kind of begin. Was this, um, I, I, I think you may have, you may have said yes. <laughs> yes, it is. But um, was this a, like when you were breaking the story, was this originally where you knew like the pilot was going to end or did it ever have a different? Yes. Okay. It was yeah. always going to end with getting her in and being like, cry, cry now. If you have to cry, cry now. We have to open the office. We knew we needed to just get her in there and then have me be like, oh my God, what I just do. Mm -hmm. And that's what it was suggested to us. Cause I sort of think, we ended it originally with just me like crying and oh my god what have i just done and then the, it was told to us that we should bring yan in and so that's how we ended that got it yes cuz he comes in and he sort of like comforts her um and i love um just the, the last line of the pilot just now what 
because it's right. like like you didn't just do the hardest yeah. thing of your life like <laughs> no, well, now we have to just, do it tomorrow and the next day right um, yeah well the um, whole visual of the city just what what they're up against is is really breathtaking yeah. yeah yeah no that was our director thought that you know just pulling out leaving them in that building and then going wide on amsterdam right was, uh, kind of a great way to 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 show the isolation and and this other thing that we felt was important which was this is what's going on behind this window think of all the other windows where similar shit is going on yes because this is happening everywhere everybody is confronted with these choices wow um okay so uh um, i have final question for each of you this has been absolutely amazing by the way i've learned so much um but uh in doing this this might be a really hard question but what what was the most challenging part of of making this mini series and then what was the most rewarding uh, for me, the most challenging part, I I wanted to, as a writer, I'll just speak as a writer because there's lots of challenging parts, but as a writer, I wanted to not, I kept saying to myself, I don't want to be a hack. I want this to be something I'm really proud of. Like, I want to really do it right, you know? And I was so scared that I had gotten so many bad habits and all of this stuff. So I was really it was a real challenge. And so it was just like a personal challenge for me to try to really do right by these people and do right by this story and trust the material and all that stuff. And the most satisfying was just making it and, and just making this thing that we're really proud of. I don't know. It just feels really good to have told their story. Yeah. I think for me, the most challenging part was the number of times when I really began to think like we're crazy for because we're doing something that every single person says don't do. Yeah. Don't tell us World War II story. Don't do period. Don't just don't do any of this stuff. <laughs> and if we had listened to those people, we never would have made it. Um, and I think the most rewarding thing was the fact that the number of survivors we met while we made it and the fact that we did a screening of it in Amsterdam for the people at the Anne Frank house and for survivors and other people who had were family members of me Pignon and, and, and the fact that they responded to it, I think, you know, tells you, okay, you know, we did, we did right. Because I think Joan's absolutely right. We, you want when you do historical drama, you want to make sure you do right by the people that you're depicting, you know. And so, the advantage, the, yeah, the advantage of doing something like this on Disney Plus is, ideally, you get younger people to see this, people who Holocaust education isn't taught as much as it used to be, and so um, maybe you reach those those people who don't know the story who are, will now go and and look yeah. it up i mean people watch television with wikipedia open on their yeah. on their laptop yeah. so. <laughs> you read that article too yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well i think um you know we can speak for everybody uh, you know who's here watching this thank you so much for uh for making the show one but also just being so candid and and generous with your time and and um this i mean I, as I said before, I learned a lot um, and, <laughs> um, and just, yeah, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you both. That was so yeah. nice. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you well, right. the chat, everyone, I mean, the chat is popping off right now with, <laughs> with thank yous. So. Hi. All right. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you.